Everybody ready? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today is March the 16th. It's a few minutes after 2 o'clock. This is the House Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee. We are now in session. Clerk, call a roll. Representatives Cochran? Here. Cooper? Here. Darby? Here. Doggett? Present. Hardaway? Halsey? Here. Hurt? Here. Potts? Reedy? Here. Rudder? Here. Shaw? Here. Todd? Here. Travis? Here. Vital? Here. Wright? Vice Chairman Grills? Here. Chairman Halford? Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, anyone with... Uh, a statement they want to make, anything they want to say. Rusty, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce my wife, Christy Grills. She is the one blushing back there. And if anybody really uh, feels sorry for her, what she has to put up with on a daily basis, y'all are welcome to take her out to eat for supper night. <laughs> just just uh, holler at me and I'll get you her number. But thank y'all <laughs> thank y'all so much uh, for making her feel welcome. Anyone else? Seeing none, we will proceed with our business. Uh, first on our calendar is House Bill 2129 by Chairman Marsh. Chairman Marsh, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, HB 2129, as amended with Amendment 14648. I have a motion and a second on the amendment. We'll go ahead and get the amendment on. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Guys, have it. The amendment is on. We're back on the bill as amended. You are recognized. Motion on, on the bill and a second. You may proceed, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This establishes the Lifetime Sportsman's Endowment Fund as an irrevocable trust for the exclusive benefit of Lifetime Sportsman's License holders. The trust will be overseen by the trustees, including the Commissioner of Finance and Administration, the State Treasurer, and executive director of the TWRA. The fund will be administered by the state treasurer and invested much like the Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System. The lifetime sportsman's license is continually increasing in popularity. Currently over 184,000 individuals hold a lifetime sportsman's license. And what we're doing here is we're starting this, this trust. There's like $71 million that they've got in the fund that they really cannot do anything with except leave it on a basically a CD. It's earning $113,000 a year. We're changing this to make it a irreparable trust for the trustees or the license holder, the sportsman's license holder. By doing that, the attorney general said that the treasurer can invest it like he invests the consolidated retirement funds. So he's gonna be able to invest this $71 million with hopefully a return of like four or five million dollars a year, which should keep us from having to raise the licenses in the future. With that, I'll answer any questions. Questions for the sponsor. Question on the Questions have been called. We are voting on House Bill 2129 to go to Finance, Ways and Means. All in favor will say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here. We're going to go out of session right quick for. Um, me to make an introduction here. I'll pass the gavel down to Vice Chairman Grills. And Chairman, you're recognized. You want to make an introduction or do you want to present the uh, HJR? I'm going to present the HJR. Well, let's, we need to go back into session for that? Yes. So we're back into session. Where's my notes? Mr. Chairman, we'll recognize you on HJR 0783. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when I would like to introduce you all to Mr. Pete Clawson. He is, uh, uh, and asked for your confirmation to the Heritage Contra Conservation Trust Fund. And uh, if Mr. Clawson would like to come up to that mic right there, make sure you, that red light's on, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Right, Mr. Chairman, hold on just a second. We need to be out of session for that. We need to get. We need to take action Sorry. on the HJR, and then we'll allow we him can, to speak. We can do that. Yes. Okay. We got a motion and a second on the on the bill. There's, you want to go out of session to yes. let this man speak? Yes. So, okay, we'll go out of uh, session without objection. Now, Mr. Chairman, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, I'm Pete Clausen. I'm from Knoxville. 
and uh, I've been uh, involved in conservation causes for uh, uh, seems like uh, 20 or 25 years. Um, that includes uh, being on the board of the Nature Conservancy, the Tennessee chapter, and was privileged to be chairman of that board. I served on the Tennessee Conservation Commission when it existed. It's been sunsetted. Uh, and uh, I've been a member of the uh, Heritage Conservation Trust Fund Board uh, I, shortly after it was established. And of course, as you may recall, they work closely with uh, the uh, Nature Conservancy and Governor Bredesen to establish the uh, large acquisition in the Upper Cumberlands, very successful. Uh, I'm also uh, closer to home. Uh, we live on the French Broad River, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, in a spot where there are, seems like, hundreds of birds. And it's an unusual spot in the river because it's, it's got uh, a drop and the river gets oxygenated, and provides lots and lots of food. And development pressures were coming. And uh, so uh, my wife and I thought that uh, maybe we could protect this. So we acquired it and uh, donated, we acquired about 300 acres and donated it to the state, and it is now the Seven Island State Birding Park. And uh, very proud of that. It's uh, been in existence since 2014, and I think they're uh, pushing uh, 500,000 visits uh, now. So it's uh, popular, and uh, of course in an urban county, so it's uh, really kind of special. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm in the railroad business. Uh, short line railroads, we have one in Knoxville. And we also build, uh, rebuild locomotives. We produce the cleanest locomotives in the world, cleanest diesel locomotives. So I stay pretty busy, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to be here and visit with y'all. And happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pete, for being here. Do we have any questions for the witness? If not, then... Uh, Come on, that's easy. You're going to have a question. <laughs> if my, my girls were here, they'd have a couple questions to ask you, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. All right. okay, Mr. Representative Shaw. Thank you. I would ask if you have any replicas of those locomotives. I love them. <laughs> we have, uh, mine are all big ones. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Mr. Pete, for being here. If there's no other questions, we'll go back into session. Thank you. Chairman Hoffer, you're recognized on HJR 783. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we confirm Mr. Crossman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I would ask that the committee confirm Mr. Crossman to the Heritage Conservation Trust Fund. Okay. You've heard them. We've got a motion and a second on this. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. On to calendar rules. That brings us to the next uh, bill on our calendar, which is 1842 by Representative Terry, and we have been asked to roll that for one week. Mm. To the heel. heel. I'm sorry, to the heel. Roll to the heel. All right, that brings us to House Bill 2457. By Representative Keesling. Representative Keesling, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion and a second. I believe we have a, an amendment that is with we, this. Well, we do, Mr. Chairman. And let me, okay, see if this corresponds 14084. Thank you. We have a motion and a second on the amendment. We'll go ahead. Put the amendment on. All in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The amendment goes on. We're back on the bill as amended. Representative Keesling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Twenty-four uh, House Bill 2457 relative to game and the uh, game and fish or game and fish laws. And if you take a look at the fiscal note on this, 
The summary is spot on. It, it prohibits the TWRA from seizing the personal property of a person without due process and further requires a court order prior to seizure of personal property. Now, the amendment zeroes in on just what personal property is. It is, uh, it is a self-propelled vehicle, which would be a motor vehicle, and along with a, um, 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 a drawn um, unit, such as a trailer or a, or a camper. And with that, um, that uh, I'll entertain any questions, Mr. Chairman, those that may have any. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was, uh, to the sponsor, I was reading through the fiscal note earlier, and what the intent on these, on the, the property that's being seized, I, I would guess this would be like uh, firearms or things like that. Would I be correct in that? No, not necessarily. No, it, now it's my understanding it, it's only it's only the uh, motor motorized ve the motorized vehicle or a trailer that that could be okay. singly attached to that to the vehicle. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, Representative Halsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's interesting to me that. <laughs> That the more we proceed down here, the more we have to pass bills that say we're we're going to make sure government obey, obeys the Constitution. That's just amazing to me. But um, if I understood it right in the past question, your your bill is only confined to a vehicle or a trailer that the vehicle's pulling, for, but for, no other for personal forfeiture. property. Yes, for immediate forfeiture. That's correct. That's does, my does, does, it, does that now, allow? We, may have, uh, we we could go out and say we may have. Uh, I don't know if Chris is here or not, TWRA, they, okay. to uh, yep. for testimony on that. Or legal. We, uh, I, if, we, if can, go to, we can go to legal, but yeah, uh, TWRA sure. is not on our list. That, that just begs the question, then, is there a loophole that we're creating by law that other property can, can be confiscated without due process? I, I, well. I'm just asking <laughs> the question. Is that the <laughs> policy or legal? <laughs> We'll go out of session later. Could you? Yeah. Uh, Levin Middleton, Office Legal Services. Um, this is, I believe, just as I understand it, uh, saying that they can't um, can't take up someone's self-propelled vehicle or vehicle propelled or drawn by a self propelled vehicle, um, but it, you know, isn't really affecting the other property. And I, I believe the other property would still have to go through due process. Yes. Other questions for legal while we might? Representative Todd. Yeah, I, I just have one. So were you referencing the amendment or the bill as amended? Uh, that would be the bill as amended. Okay, thank you. Other questions for legal while we're out of session? Seeing none, we'll go back into session. Representative Keesley. With that, uh, again, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll continue to entertain any questions. That Other questions for Representative Keesley? Questions been called on the bill. We are voting to send House Bill 2457 to calendar rules. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. But before I make an exit, I'd like to look at you, Mr. Chairman. This may be my final time in front of you as chairman of our Ag Committee. I just want to say that I love you. I thank you for mentoring me from the time I entered the halls of Legislative Plaza. We shared an office space together. We did. You were I appreciate you so much, and you just don't know how much. You, you, you'll never realize how much, and it was just thrill me to to be uh, down there at your uh, at your wedding vows when you repeated those wedding vows. You're a dear friend of mine, and I appreciate you so much. And I I just wanted to say that because again, it'll be my final time. So thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate members.
Next on our calendar will be House Bill 2768 by Representative Sherrill. Representative Sherrill, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman have and a members. Motion and a second. I believe we have an amendment on this. Yes, bill. sir. Correct? Amendment have a motion number. And a second on the amendment. Let's get the amendment on the bill. All in favor of, of the amendment? Uh, yeah, the, what's the drafting number that you have? 014135. That's correct. That's right. Okay. We're voting to add the minimum amendment. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The amendment is on. We're back on the bill as amended. You are recognized. Thank you, Chairman. House Bill 2768, which is amended uh, by 014135, is amended, requires Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency to comply with all proceeds of the Department of, of the Agriculture Division of the Forestry when conducting sales of timber harvested from the TWRA property that they manage, which belongs to the state of Tennessee. Uh, in our area that I'm in the 43rd district up in our area in the district there, we have been having problems with uh, uh, on the Farstone Brigstone property up there that belongs to the state of Tennessee where TWRA has been coming in and cutting hardwoods. And as they cut these hardwoods, the money that has been harvested from this uh, goes back into the pocket of TWRA and not of the state of Tennessee. So we're trying to... Uh, put a little guidelines on TWRA, so that's what the b bill does with the amended. So I'd appreciate your consideration. You have heard the explanation of the bill as amended. Are there questions for the sponsor? Representative Cochran. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sherrill, just one quick question. Um, yes, sir. The, the money, the current, the money that uh, is generated currently from the sale of that timber, does it go into a to a designated fund in TWRA, or, how, or does it go into their what would be what we would consider more of a general fund? I, I didn't know if I didn't know if it went into a fund that helped them maintain that particular area. I just wanted to know if you had a little bit more info on that. Truthfully, I don't know exactly what how, what fund it does go into to TWRA, but it does go back into the pockets of TWRA. So, how do they put that? I'm not for sure exactly. Representative Cochran, you have follow-up. Representative Todd. I just wanted to ask you, you happen to know, I know forestry, the Division of Forestry and Agriculture, um, does quite a bit of timber harvesting. They bid that out, and, and, and I don't know that I've ever known exactly where those proceeds go. If they go to the general fund, I, I think they do, but um, I'm not 100% sure of that. And I didn't know if you'd ever come across that or research that. I'm pretty sure that the money from the forestry, the money goes back into the general fund. And maybe uh, Chairman Halford might have some information on that. I'm not for sure with your connection with uh, forestry. Or I, I am not. No, sir, I'm sorry. I don't know. I really don't know for sure, but I think it goes back into the general fund, if I understand what I've heard right. Representative Todd. Thank you. And, and that, my only point was, if that's the case, and, and like I said, I think it is, but um, if it is, this is just getting another agency that may be in control of some timber harvest on state property in the same posture, so that the money would still be going to the same location. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Representative Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. This may have been answered. I was responding to something here, but what's the current process that uh, TWRA is following for the sale of timber to my understanding right now that it's just like TWRA they fall under like a different entity of the state of Tennessee different than other departments so uh, for instance this property that was given to the state of Tennessee back years ago uh, from Firestone Brigstone and I'm using this area here it went into the hands of the state of Tennessee well the state of Tennessee then uh, put it under the hands of TWRA. So they're supposed to be managing this property. And as they come in and cut a lot of the timber off of properties, not only in our location where we're talking about this, but uh, as I'm hearing from other parts of the state of Tennessee, and then when they harvest the, prop the timber off of the property, they take this money and put it back in their pockets instead of it going back into the general fund, which it should go instead of going into their pockets. That's fine. Thank you. 
Other questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're voting on. I'm sorry, Representative Travis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm just a little bit confused. So, uh, Representative Cheryl, the money that they get off of this now will go completely to the general fund instead of TWRA, or will it be a percentage, or will it? Well, the money won't change at this present thing. What this does right here, it puts them in under, uh, they'll have to go by the regulations at the way the, the uh, Department of Agriculture does right now in the Division of Forestry. Instead of them doing it the way they do it, it'll have to come through and be done like agriculture you. does. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sponsor. Uh, is, is there any agreement that the state turned the property over to TWRA to manage? You, you did say that, right? Yes. Is there any agreement between TWRA and the state that since they are the manager, they would get the proceeds of the property? Is there any such agreement like that in place? To my understanding right now, the way that it is, when they are supposed to be managing this property that belongs to the state of Tennessee, okay, you and I and everyone else, okay, they're managing it, so they are allowed right now to pretty well do what they want to do with this property. So they go in and harvest this timber, and they take this money and put it in their pocket. It don't go into the general fund. So that don't really have, this don't have anything really to do with the money but they're going to have to follow the guidelines under the Department of Agriculture, what they'll be doing in the future if this bill goes through the process. Representative Shaw. But you don't know if there is a present agreement before, before this legislation go forward. Is there any present agreement that when the state of Tennessee said to TWRA, manage this property, were any agreement made at that point to say if the timber's ever cut in this management agreement, you can cut the timber and keep timber and keep the proceeds? Well, is there any, that's what I'm asking. Is there any kind of agreement like that already in place? I'm sure there are, uh, Representative Shaw, because right now the money don't go back to the, the Treasury of the state of Tennessee. Oh, well, I guess my question would be just final question is if there is an agreement, uh, then would TWRA be breaking the rules to put the money in their pocket if that agreement is in place? And I don't know if it is or not, but that's what I'm asking. If the agreement is in place, are they breaking the rules to put the money back in their pockets? I, and I don't believe they're breaking the rules, to my understanding, what I've been told about. I don't believe they're breaking any rules of doing it. But again, in this situation, but it's not really this bill, the money that they get, they put it in back into TWRA, which hopefully we will change that in the future where that money will go back into the general fund instead of going into their pocket to be managed. So right now we're just doing this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Rudder. Representative Rudder. I'm just curious, if you say TWRA manages the property, yes, if they manage the property, why wouldn't they keep the proceeds from the sale of the timber? I just don't understand that. At the present time, they are, yes, getting the money. Yes, but okay. your, your legislation, the way I understand it, is that now they still are going to manage the property. Yes, ma'am. But the, the sale of the timber... Would the profits from the sale of the timber would go into the general fund of the state? Not now. But under your legislation, it would. No, ma'am. Okay, where where does it go? I'm I'm not. It will continue to go in TWRA's pocket. Okay. All this does right here is where they're going to be required. TWRA is going to be required to go through the same procedure that our Department of Forestry goes through. See, we have a Department of Agriculture and we have a Department of Forestry, which falls under Commissioner Hatcher, right? So they're going to have to go with the same guidelines. If this bill goes through, they'll have to go through the same guidelines 
is our Department of Forestry. TWRA will have to. Representative Rudder? I don't exactly understand that, but okay. <laughs> Representative Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I want to try to get us back on the rails a little bit here. So first of all, I, I'll point out, as I pointed out before, that, that the, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and the Commission uh, is a subdivision of the state. Uh, we created them. The legislature created them. They keep them around, just like the Department of Agriculture. Under the Department of Agriculture, the Division of Forestry manages an awful lot of state property. And they sell timber, they have, they have proper management techniques they go by, they have those te same techniques they, they recommend to the, the general public to go by. And so your bill, though, all it deals with is the processes of, of managing that timber and how they cut the timber it has nothing to do with the proceeds or right. where money's going. It's only dealing with the processes that the Department of Agriculture Division of Forestry uh, recommends for timber harvest. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So this bill has nothing to do with it going, the money going back into the general fund. It stays in the TWRA's cash or what have you. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we are voting to send House Bill 2768 to Calendon Rules. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it. Thank you, Chairman Thank and you, members. Sir. Next up is House Bill 2033 by Representative Freeman. Representative Freeman, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. A motion uh, and a second. I believe we have an amendment here. If you'll give us the drafting yes, code. Yes, sir. I've got 014093. That's what we have. Yes, sir. You may continue. Right. And, and um, do we want to put the amendment on and then I can talk about it at... at, at we can put the amendment no. on. All in favor of the... Am amendment. We have a motion and a second on the amendment. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, say no. I have it. The amendment is on. We're back on the bill as amended. Thank you, sir. Uh, so last year uh, we passed a CPACE legislation, and uh, as we were beginning to implement this, there were a couple of things that we needed to uh, come and, and, and do some cleanup on. Uh, over the summer, we worked with bankers um, uh, on this to get this back uh, in, in the correct form. The correction from last year's bill uh, states the amount of assessment plus any existing indebtedness on the property does not exceed 90% of the fair market value and the amount of the assessment does not exceed 25% 20 of, the, uh, of, the, of, of the, um, um, the fair market value as well. Uh, the clarification of definition and what a commercial property is uh, is, is also changed. This bill states that a property owned by a state or local government uh, but leased to a private entity such as a housing authority, industrial development authority, uh, could constitute as a commercial property under CPACE. Uh, we clarified the fees in which local governments could charge for being the program administrator. Um, and uh, the, the, the amendment that we just put on says that uh, any state or local government must be held harmless. Um, all parties have signed off, bankers, local governments, and the property assessors. You have heard the explanation of the bill as amended. Are there questions for the sponsor? Questions have been called on the bill. We are voting on House Bill 2033 as amended to go to Calendon Rules. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it. Thank you, Chairman Committee. That brings us to House Bill 1690 by Representative Hurt, and I am told that that is to be rolled one week. It brings us to House Bill 2056 by Representative Hurt. Representative Hurt, you are recognized. We do have a motion and a second. I believe we have uh, at least one amendment we need to deal with. I have 0147779. Okay, Mr. Chair, help me. Uh I want to make sure I do this right because these numbers are similar and last week we actually considered the wrong amendment and we want to go with 
this one, which you may have just said this number, 014779. That's what I have, yes. Yes, sir. A motion and a second on the amendment. Let's get the amendment on. All in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The amendment is on. We're back on the bill as amended. Representative Hurt, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment requires, or this legislation as amended, requires each large lease for the installation of solar equipment to include a decommissioning plan with financial assurances. The word large means a solar power facility capable of generating more than 10 gigawatts. That facility would require about 100 acres of land for the solar panels. Recognizing and hoping that House Bill 2761 by Representative Gant that authorizes a TASR study will eventually pass, it seems premature to try to address all the issues a large solar installation may bring. The amendment reflects a consensus between the Farm Bureau and the Solar Energy Indust Industry Association. This amendment requires each lease for the installation of solar equipment to include a decommissioning plan with financial assurances. The plan may not be waived by agreement. The amendment does make this a statewide standard. An individual or local government harmed may seek a declaratory judgment. The effective date is June 1st, 2022, and the bill will apply to agreements entered into after that date. But if an older lease is amended, both parties may agree that this bill will apply going forward. Pending any questions, I'd appreciate your support. Mr. Chair, and uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Questions for the sponsor. Representative Halsey. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow. Um, I understand the solar panels that you're talking about takes up quite a bit of space, and it's premature to evaluate exactly what that's going to do and how it's going to shape out and how it's going to affect the people around there until it goes through the TASSER study. But I don't understand the declaratory judgment part of that. Is that, that, is that saying that, that it's binding and they can't get out of it? Um, I just don't know what that means. That may, Mr. Chair, that may be a question for legal, um, uh, that definition. <laughs> Love Middleton, Office of Legal Services. Um, a declaratory judgment is just a binding judgment document from a court setting uh, forth what the relationship between the parties are. So it's just a type of relief that a party can get in a certain situation, such as that laid out here. I got you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for the legal issue? Well, we're out. Representative Todd. It, as amended, would you interpret this to still be allowing the, or requiring the Department of Environment and Conservation to publish a sample solar easement agreement uh, that, and it has these additional stipulations in it? Is that really all we're doing here is just having the department set up a sample instrument for folks? Is that the intent? Um, so the amendment makes the bill, so it removes the language um, about the sample solar easement instrument. Um, I can check real quick to see if that's still in code, but the amendment does remove that and, and makes the bill. Okay, that's, that's kind of the clarif clarification I was trying to get because I'm reading through the, the summary here of the amendment and wanted to see if it's adding to or exactly how it rewrote it. Thank um, you. Yes. Other questions for legal? Seeing none, we'll go back into session. Representative Halsey, you are recognized. Anyone else with questions? Representative Frills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Hurt, my understanding that what you're trying to do is just to make sure that every that if something does go south um, in the process here, at the end of it, the the county or the T deck or whomever it is is not held holding the bags trying to get things cleaned up. Is that ultimately the effort? Into grills. Watch it. I lost you there for a minute. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that, along with the landowner, Representative Grills, um, to protect them because we're kind of moving forward into a direction that, that's kind of uncharted right now, and we sure. just want to make sure everybody involved is protected until we get this TASR study back and we know exactly what we're dealing with. Representative Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Hurt. Thanks for the efforts. Uh, obviously, Lake County's got a pretty sizable. Uh, solar farm going in up there and I appreciate the effort you're putting forth here to protect those uh, landowners and adjacent landowners and uh, maybe there's a great future here but uh, 
you can never be too secure in making sure you got things in order. Thank you, bud. Representative Travis. Question's been called on the bill. We are voting on House Bill. I've lost my number here. Representative Hertz, House Bill 2056 to go to calendar and rules. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Go to calendar and rules. Representative Hertz. Thank you. That brings us back to uh, House Bill 1842 that we rolled a little bit. Representative Terry, I believe that's your bill. Uh, you are recognized. Have a motion and a second. I believe we have an amendment we need to deal with. Can you give us the uh, code? Yes, I'm going to go with amendment 14435. That's the amendment that came out of the subcommittee. That's what we have. Motion on the amendment. Let's, let's get the amendment on. All in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. We're back on the bill as amended. You are uh, recognized. Thank you, Chairman Committee. Uh, having worked with you know, on the landfill issues and uh, in my discussions with TDEC, uh, what I found was in uh, current statute, there's areas that needed to be clarified. And so what this bill basically does is clarifies the intent as it relates to the application process for expanding a class one landfill. Um, it's never been the intent of the TDEC commissioner to prematurely interject in that process. Um, and so that's what this bill does is uh, allows that process to go through and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're voting on House Bill 1842 to go to calendar and rules. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. I have it. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. All right. That brings us back to House Bill number 2516 by Representative Reedy, you are recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 2516 has a, get a motion an and amendment a on the bill. that rewrites the bill. The amendment number is 14890. That's what we have. You may, you may continue, sir. Oh, let's get the amendment on. All in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Back on the bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. This is the flood resilience uh, bill that uh, been working with with the uh, flood ready Tennessee coalition this bill it's it's a two-year task force that will end in July 1st of 2024 there's an interim report that needs to be done by 2023 with that mr. chairman small town mayors EMA directors and longtime residents have intimate knowledge of the problem areas within their communities to them solving flooding issues may appear to be as simple as clearing creeks and ditches however true lasting solutions may involve mitigation projects far upstream or downstream of a community and outside the expertise of local officials who are splitting time between many responsibilities the flood risk reduction and resilience plan will unlock the state's technical expertise and re resources necessary to ensure communities are solving flooding problems in ways that are responsible, sustainable, and get a root cause of the flooding. And then coming off of the fiscal note, it, it creates the Tennessee Flood Resilience Community Preparedness Task Force. The task force will have no less than 19 members, but no more than 25, and be under the direction of TEMA. And what it does, uh, chairman and committee members, because of the situation, the flooding that's statewide, we would like all of the many departments that are listed in the bill to participate in the discussion of this and, and try to find a resolution to the flooding in the different areas. Um, it was interesting, 8.30 this morning, the Senate Government Operations took this bill up and it was uh, some great testimony from the members sitting on that committee talking about in their areas from the 2010 flood that, that happened here in Nashville, but especially in East Tennessee, what's going on there. And, and that's the intent of this two-year task force to try to pinpoint those problems, uh, identify them, prioritize them, help the local communities solve that problem. But this also sets up the Flood Resilience Reserve Fund, and it's visiting with the Department of Military. It's interesting how we can take public-private dollars when we start this fund, 
and get it matched at the federal level because we're going to need quite a few dollars in order to come into our different cities, towns, counties and, and try to resolve these flooding issues that uh, last year took 29 lives. And, and a, it's, it's interesting, we spend nearly 250,000, or uh, what was it, 250 million a year in the aftermath of the cleanup. And of course, the fiscal note on this is because of the task force uh, paying for their per diem, which I, I look at that and saying it's only 10% uh, up front is what we're going to, to spend to try to resolve this issue. But uh, I, I certainly look forward to it. And as Mr. Chairman, you know, for several years now, I've been having this discussion, especially in my district. And uh, Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'll take any questions. Questions for Representative Reedy. Representative Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Reedy, uh, obviously, first off, the 29 lives that were lost last year, that's just horrible in itself. Um, the effort you, that, that you're putting forth here, uh, in your, right there at the beginning of your talk a while ago, you said something about the state's resources and, and using all of the state's resources. Do we have those resources now and we're just not taking advantage of them? Is that what, I'm not trying to say you were implying that, but no. do we have those and we're not taking advantage of them and, and they're at our disposal and this is what this bill is trying to do? Uh, 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 Chairman Grills, that's, uh, that's exactly right because it's, it's TDEC has some funding as well as ECD has funding as, as well as uh, FEMA, TEMA, and, and of course we, we can't get the federal government to come to the table, but I think by getting all of these individual departments in the same room agreeing that we've got a problem and pinpointing those problems, we can make the request at the federal level to pull down federal dollars as well as use state state funding to, to hopefully for collaboration to, to solve these issues or problems. Representative Grill. So is there not a task force already within, inside of TDEC or TEMA that deals with these type of issues that, uh, that uh, these, these flooding issues or catastrophic flooding events well, like my, this? My, my seven years working on it, I'm not familiar <laughs> with any of them. Follow up, Representative Grills. No, I'm good. Representative Cooper, you're recognized. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, this bill, I was trying to get everything that you said, uh, help families who have homes in flooded areas. Uh, Representative Cooper, it, in the long run, this will be beneficial to the families, but it doesn't, this bill does not cover that aspect of, of rebuilding or relocating. But in the long run, it may have some uh, yes, ma'am, because, uh, of course, the August flood in, in Humphreys County, me visiting with, with TEMA and, and TDEC, and, of course, the conversation comes out, 600 uh, homes were lost, and in those 600 homes, we really need to convey the information to those property owners that it is best that they don't rebuild in that area because year after year it takes place, mm -hmm. and especially those folks that come into town after a disaster purchases the property and rebuilds there, and then the new ownership is not familiar with the flooding issues of, of historical past, and, and I, I don't think that should happen either. You well, know, I agree it. with that, and I, the reason why I mentioned that to you, because in one, one area of the district that I represent is in a fog zone, and a lot of seniors have been there for years. Right. And every time the Mississippi River rises to a certain level, then uh, the county, uh, has a responsibility of slapping uh, some type of notice on their back immediately. Well, these senior citizens have to come out of their homes and stay somewhere until the the, the river recedes. So I, that's why I was asking you. We need some help, uh, assistance down there. And I hope that I do support your bill, and I hope that something comes out of this to help everyone. No, yes, ma'am. Other questions for Representative Reedy? Question Seeing none. Please. We are voting to send House Bill 2516 to Finance, Ways, and Means. All in favor will say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it. We're going to go out of session. The next bill is mine, and we will turn the gavel over to Representative Hurt. I'm sorry, Representative Grills. That's twice I've gotten y'all mixed up today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are in session 
taking up uh, item number 10, HB 213, represent our Chairman Hawford. Motion. Have a motion and a second on the bill. Chairman Hawford, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And House Bill 213 is brought to me by the Veterinarian Association. And what it does, it updates the Tennessee Veterinary Practice uh, to mirror the practice of other health related boards in Tennessee and to allow a current member of the Tennessee Board of Veterinary Medical, Exa Medical Examiners to re be reappointed to certain successive terms. And number two, it updates the def definition of veterinary facility to reflect the current state of practice in veterinary medicine. For instance, uh, you might have down Charlotte Avenue, Nashville Vet Clinic, and on down the street, you might have Nashville Veterinarian Hospital. So that may be misleading to some others that think that uh, the term hospital and the would mean that they're more qualified or more educated, and uh, that's not what we are seeking to do here. So uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would renew my motion. Do we have any questions for Chairman Hawford? Question Questions been called on the bill. Any objections? Seeing none, we'll be voting on HB 213. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> on to calendar and rules. Chairman Hawford, congratulations. Thank you. I'll try to get your name right. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right. Next on our agenda here today, we have a couple of uh, presentations, uh, one from Tennessee Dairy Producers Association and one from the Tennessee Fruit and Vegetable Association. And I, I will warn you, gentlemen, that we are practically out of time. We will have a ve very short period of time, but we're going to cheat just a little bit here and let you uh, come up and, and give a short presentation if you don't mind. And we will start with uh, uh, the Tennessee Dairy uh, Producers Association. Mr. Stan Butts, you are recognized. Oh, we're out of session. Thank you, Chairman Hufford, Vice Chair Grills. I want to uh, commend Tanner Poss. He's done an outstanding job of following up, making sure we are where we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be, and, and doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, it's my privilege to address the committee today, uh, committee members, uh, about briefly, I understand we are short of time, about the Tennessee Dairy Producers Association. Uh, they were organized and chartered as a nonprofit uh, by uh, Trey Hargett, and that was in 2009. Uh, they were operated by volunteers for approximately four years, and in summer of 2013, uh, they decided they needed somebody to assist them to, to help the association, represent the association. Uh, so they acquired uh, me. Uh, I was strong-armed into taking this position. Uh, you know, they said, we got enough money to pay you for a month and a half. If you can't raise the funds or if you can't uh, solicit dairies to support us, then you're out of business. So that's the challenge that I faced. Uh, I can proudly say that uh, seven years later, I told them I would do it for five years, and they said, you got to keep doing it until you die, so that's kind of where we are. Uh, as far as the dairy industry, when I took over this position in, in July of 13, then we had 394 permitted dairies uh, representing approximately 48,000 cows producing uh, point, about 8.76 million pounds of milk, which represented uh, about $175 million in economic impact to the Department of Ag uh, at the time, which put us in about fourth position uh, ahead of poultry. Now, since then, poultry has leapfrogged over us. And, uh, but at the time, that was a circumstance. Uh, as far as uh, impact uh, of dairy is to the ag econ economic uh, impact, then uh, it continues to be uh, a major part of agriculture, even though uh, today we only have 148 permitted dairies. Uh, that's down approximately 40%. Uh, uh, and even though we're down from the numbers, we're only down about 15% uh, as far as volume. Uh, we're still producing by 28,000 cows. Uh, economic impact dollars of about 150 million. So we're only off uh, 
a little bit from that because most of the dairies have increased numbers. So uh, <clears throat> the cause of the decline, uh, the price of the milk for many years, uh, if you will understand what happened in 20, uh, the price of milk went from $20 100 weight to about 14 or 15, which uh, greatly impacted our producer's ability to operate. Uh, cost of production uh, skyrocketed today because of increased prices of grain and feed. It continues to be an issue. And one of the problems for the reduction in numbers of, of dairy is because many are, are aging out, continue to age out, and, and it's not profitable from a small dairy operation. So most of the operations that, that went away were small dairies. Uh, the current issues facing our industry, again, is cost of production because of prices of grain, because of fuel. Uh, everybody's experienced that in the last uh, several weeks. Uh, diesel was above $5, you know, the increase, farming. Uh, several of you on the committee understand that fully. Uh, and the cost of hauling for transportation of that milk. Uh, so what's possible solutions uh, is uh, to raise the price that's paid for milk. And, and I think the new uh, owners of our processing plants in Tennessee, which came as a result of Dean Foods taking bankruptcy, uh, and Dairy Farmers of America now uh, own and operate those processing plants in East Tennessee and Mayfield, Middle Tennessee Purity, partnership with Prairie Farms uh, and DFA in Memphis or the old Turner processing plant. So they are putting more emphasis on local milk, which will help the, the transportation cost. Uh, there are uh, several dairies in the state who have advanced to robotic milkers. And so that's helped with labor issues. Uh, everybody is experiencing labor issues in any industry, and, and there's uh, a part of that. And so uh, they're look the ones who are continuing to be in business are committed. Uh, and so uh, from that standpoint, we have worked with UT. We have worked with the Department of Agriculture and many of the industry stakeholders as well as the lending institutions and we continue to strive to uh, have a viable uh, part of the dairy industry even though we have reduced numbers. With that, uh, I'll entertain any questions. Uh, otherwise, thank you for the opportunity to, to make this presentation. Representative Halsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, the 40 percent drop down to 148 dairies, is that over the last year or 10 years? Or? No, that's over the last five years. Five years. Yes, sir. Okay, and the processing plants that you mentioned, is there only three, one in east, middle, and west? Uh, of commercial scales. Okay. Now, there are a few value-added uh, dairies uh, that process their own milk, uh, that uh, produce and process their own milk, and and there's one on the plateau, there's two in East Tennessee, there's two in Middle Tennessee, and, and there's one down towards uh, the western part of the state. But now for the most part, uh, they are commercial type dairies that, that milk anywhere from 150 to 1,600 cows. Wow. Do, do you think there could be an expanding market for milk that is not homogenized and pasteurized, just whole milk? Well, the value-added producers address that homogenation process. Uh, Hatcher Dairy, uh, Sunrise on the Plateau, they, they offer non-homogenized milk, what they refer to as cream line. Uh, what most of us, that we grew up 1900, none of your business experience. So, uh, uh, you know, we, you know, if you wanted to uh, shake up the cream, you had to shake it up. Otherwise, yep. you floated it and, and made butter out of it or whatever. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I, I, I care a whole lot about that industry. Uh, they're, they're suffering, but thank well, you. Well, I'm not an employee, and so I save them a whole lot of money. I'm on contract uh, to them, and so in the last several years, I've tried to prohibit my travel and do my, what I can by phone and and communications with uh, the people that I've established rapport with, and it's worked out really well. So uh, the expense to them from the standpoint of my cost has gone down drastically. Other questions for Stan while we're having? Stan, we appreciate you being here. Good information. Thank you. Yes, sir. And it's also my privilege to have worked with you. 
Uh, I'll probably get to see you one more time next week on Ag Day on the Hill. We look so, forward to uh, it. Hey, I look forward to that. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Next on our list is uh, the Fruit, Tennessee Fruit and Vegetable Association, Mr. Reggie Marshall. There's Reggie. Chairman Hallford for having me. Reggie, uh, good to see you again. Likewise, and thank, thank you guys for inviting me today. I'll make this fairly quick. Um, just tell you a little bit about me. I'm, uh, um, I grew up in Jackson, Tennessee on a small farm. I came to TSU, and there you go. <laughs> and I uh, came to TSU, got a degree in agriculture and animal science, and later got a degree in nursing. So I just recently retired from nursing on six, uh, September of last year. Uh, with the Fruit and Vegetable Association, our, our main mission has always been to educate farmers, growers on uh, to grow and grow what they sell and sell what they grow, because that, that we all know that's when you're going to get your greatest margins. Uh, also, we, uh, we we we're we're an advocate for growers, and because of the, uh, a few things have gone on with the pandemic, going forward with the Pick Tennessee Conference this year, I wanted to make sure the Fruit and Vegetable Association advocated for the things that meant meant most to the, to the growers and. So what I did is I went with a, with a, collaborated with the Center for Profitable Ag, and we created a survey which has given us some guidelines for what, what growers actually need to, to move forward in the, in the industry. Um, and, uh, the fruit and vegetable industry accounts for about $100 million in, in over $100 million in sales in the state of Tennessee and covers over 2,500 farms. Um, in that industry, some of the things that they, 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 they want to talk more about and, and, and want me to advocate for is for labor, uh, which we all know that's that's a you know we've got guest labor programs that are in place but they're very expensive. Uh, we've got uh, TCAT Crump down in, in in West Tennessee now that has a farm uh, worker program that's a part of their curriculum, which that's that's something we'd like to see throughout the state of Tennessee because right now when you look at young people, period, in, in the state of Tennessee, whether you're in a rural county or an urban area, most of them don't have farm experience. You know, to a lot of us who started driving at five, six, seven years old, like I, I did, you know, people just don't like, you know, they, they, sometimes they call it child abuse. It's not really child abuse. It's just a necessity of the farm, right? So, uh, the, but this TCAT crump program facilitates that. It helps get these young people or in, individuals who may need a second career or just may need some type of employment a, a chance to learn how to work on a farm. Uh, also, uh, the things that, that are ailing fruit and vegetable growers now is, is the inputs. You know, we've got Looked at a study the other day from Texas A&M where from 2020 to 2021, uh, uh, essential fertilizers on the farm went up 50% and they're expecting another 80% increase. And so I know that for a fact with some of the water soluble fertilizer that I use in that time period went up 50%. So it's, it's in line with what I'm paying. And I'm, I have a small urban farm here in Nashville as well. Um, so uh, also, we need to look at, with all the inputs being so expensive, we need to start looking at regenerative agriculture more seriously. Because long term, we, we can't expect our producers to continue to produce and make money and stay in business if we don't look at things that are going to extend the life of the farm. Um, and, you know, coming from nursing, I'll tell you a little bit about my nursing career. I was a house supervisor at the hospital. And during that time, you know, prior to the pandemic, everything seemed to be okay. But, you know, I retired because of my health, blood pressure, and also mental health. I started having panic attacks, nervous breakdowns, and so the same thing that has affected me in the pandemic has been affecting farmers. We talked a lot about mental health during the pandemic, but we've kind of looked at other things beyond mental health, and I think in order for our farmers to continue to progress and, and live, and you know, there's such a high rate of suicide in our industry that a lot of people don't talk about. In order for that, that them to move forward and to, to sustain themselves, we cannot forget about mental health, okay? And uh, I, I, like I said, make this quick. Do you guys have any questions for me? Questions for Mr. Marshall, Representative Reedy. I, I appreciate you being here and touching on the mental health aspect of it. And of course, it's, it's uh, the proof right now is what you stated. It's in, in, in all professions. And of course, as a, a, a small town farm boy it, it, growing up, that was your escape is to get away from it. But when you try to make a living off of it and the economic impacts that hit you, yes, it will stress you out as, as well. And we need to get back to that happy zone, if you will, as, as far as our farming, you know, sticking the toes in the fresh soil come springtime 
and in trying to escape the rest of the craziness of, of the world. But I appreciate your information and, your, and for you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions for our guest? Major, we appreciate you being here very much. All right. We look forward to seeing you again. All right. Thank you all so much. Right. Thank you for being here. We will go back into session, and the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. We are adjourned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>